intelligencesquared.com. First of all, thank you. I'm sorry I corrected you, but... Yeah, uh, I'm, yeah. I'm humiliated. Shalom, yeah, and good evening to all of you. Uh, you know, I started my uh, career, a very American word, as a writer, uh, by writing about the, the big topics, the major topics of being an Israeli, being a Jew, I wrote about uh, the Israeli occupation in the smile of the lamb, and I wrote about the, the Holocaust, the Shoah in Sea and the Love. And then I wrote The Yellow Wind that you have mentioned, and I wrote a book about the Israeli Palestinians, and then I felt that I cannot continue writing about our situation. Uh, the situation has continued, of course, but I felt that I don't have any more new words or new formulations to, uh, to revitalize this situation, to make it sharp and poignant to, to the people who will read me. Um, almost every article that I have read then, or a book, I felt as if you know, I knew it before. There was nothing new, nothing fresh. And I myself, as I said, was unable to, to create the language to, to cope with this situation. And for some years, I, I just decided to write about other topics, other things, very private, intimate things about a jealousy of, of a husband to his wife. He becomes almost crazed with jealousy for her, or I wrote about the, the biblical hero Samson, or I wrote about homeless children in Jerusalem. And in, in the same time, I wrote many articles and I did all kinds of political things. I, I was part of the team who created the Geneva Agreement, the Geneva Accord between us and the Palestinians. And yet, you know, I didn't find my way to, to to touch this reality. And then uh, in 2003, when my eldest son, Jonathan, was about to, to be out of the army, to leave the army after three years of service, and uh, my second son, Uri, was about to join the army, suddenly, and I guess because of anxiety or just a need to accompany him as much as I can because I knew that he will serve in the occupied territories as most of Israeli soldiers. Uh, and I, I suddenly had this idea, this really unusual, strange idea, I think, for the circumstances about this mother who sends her son to the army and then she she goes back home and, and she starts to have very strong intuition that something bad might happen to him. And then since she realizes that it takes two for bad news, one to deliver and one to receive, she thinks, what if I am not there to receive? So all this machinery, the wheel of machinery of the notification, which is very developed in Israel, it will be taken back, you know, delayed for a day until they find her or a minute. In such acute moments, even a minute will do, you know, something will, she will be able to change something in reality to prevent the, the catastrophe. And once I had this idea, I started to have the story and the language. Suddenly I knew how I want to write it. And I knew that it will allow me to do two things that I was looking for. One is to describe the general situation, which we call, in Hebrew, there is a word for it, we call it hamatzav. Hamatzav is the situation. By, by, by saying hamatzav, we encompass everything, you know, the occupation and terror and despair and, and the, the anxiety regarding having or not having a future there. All of it, we say hamatzav, and by saying that, we excuse ourselves from any nuances. And, and you know, 
It's even, when you say hamatzav, it's like a divine decree. No one really created this matzav. Yeah, it, it's like, you know, it's hovering above us. And, you know, you think that this word is such a euphemism for a constant bleeding of 100 years and more than that. But for us, it's, it's enough. So I thought it will allow me to write about hamatzav and to, you know, to melt it into all its ingredients. But also, I wanted so much to write about the life of one family within this hamatzav. To see what happens to a family, to the relationship between the members of the family and to the members themselves, and to what they are able to talk about and what they cannot dare to talk about and how all these silences grow. And not only in, in relation to the situation, but I'm fascinated, like every writer, like you are, by families. Families are really, they are so intriguing. I, I always think you know, that the greatest moments of mankind in our history, they have not occurred on battlefield or in parliaments or in palaces, but rather in kitchens and in rooms of children, in, in bedrooms. And I tried to document in, in this, this book all these small moments from which a family is created and a child is created. There is a moment in the book when Ora, Ora is the, the main character, the, the female, the mother character. And uh, she says, how many, how, how many thousands of moments of devotion and effort and goodwill and disappointments and failures are needed in order to create, to accumulate one human being in this life. And later she adds one human being that is so easy to destroy. And this is what the book is about, about the creation, about the fear of destruction, which in a way is something very private and intimate that every Israeli feels, and of course myself feel, but also in a way I think it's the story of Israel because these two layers, the, the wholeness of life and the fear of death, this rare combination of two contradictory dimensions that creates the very unique, I think, Israeli vibration and vitality. This is what, what the book is about. You, you chose to have as your, the consciousness of this novel, a mother rather than a father. What, why is this? I know you, you really like attempting to enter the mystery of the mind of a woman, the ultimate other, as we, you know, we are all the ultimate others to yeah. each other. I thought, you know, a book that tells so much about family and raising up of children, I felt it's more appropriate that it would be described through the eyes of, of a woman, of a mother. I think that, I, I think it's hard to argue that the connection of the mother and the child is more primal, I think, than the connection between the father and the child, and I say it as a very motherly father, you know, I'm deeply, so devotedly involved in the life of my children, but always I, I felt that it is slightly different. I know so many men who, who, who told me that, you know, they said, I will start really to befriend or to be deeply connected with my child when he or she starts speaking you know, when they accept the, the constitution of the language, which is more, you know, a masculine thing, according to Lacan, for example. And I think it's such, I mean, such a waste of, of the very first months of the child when, when he's or she is so expressive in a non-verbal way. And, and I know how, how much my life has been enriched, enhanced, when I became a father. But I also felt that usually men will not run away from 
the news of the army. That in a way, because men are more responsible for this system of the army and system of war, and generally speaking, men throughout history, they, are, they have created or they are more a major part of all these big systems of the state, the government, army, war, than, than women. And those big systems, they reward men more than they reward women, even when they kill men, mm -hmm. they reward them. Mm -hmm. there, there is, uh, I once read, Borges wrote that uh, in, in the Nordic saga, the word for war is net of men, and you can almost, men with E, M-E-N, mm -hmm. yeah, you can all, almost see, you know, a huge net thrown on a large group of men, capturing them together, and then they, they start kill each other. You know, the idea that people come to a certain point in order to kill each other. We got used to it. I mean, it's almost banal to say, but it's so monstrous to think of it. And I thought, when I thought of, you know, some of the women that I know, that there, there are, in almost every one of them, there was a kind of a slight skepticism regarding these boys' games. Now, I do not say that they are not belligerent, aggressive, violent women. I do not say, I don't want to idealize or women or to demonize men, but I find more, more frequently among women this slight, you know, look from the side, skeptical, regarding this obedience of the men with this authority of armies and, and war. And I thought it's more natural for a woman to, to run away. Now, she runs away, but it's not an escapism. She's, she's very active in her running away. First, as she, you have mentioned, she kidnaps Avram, the love of her youth, the love of her life. And, and in a way, Avram is a kind of a destroyed person because he was tortured by the Egyptians in the Yom Kippur War. And he doesn't want to have any contact with life. But she, very gradually and cleverly, she intrigues him, she lures him back to life, and she does it by telling him the story life of Ophir. And I think you, 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 you feel, when you read the book, you feel as if she, she deposits Ophir in the lap of Avram. And by so doing, she brings Avram back to life. She gives birth to Avram. Mm -hmm. We don't know if she will be able to save Ofer in the end. This is, I say it already now, it's an open ending, you know. But she saves, she saves Avram. And, and I, I got a letter from a reader, a lady who wrote me in, uh, from Brazil, and she said, Maybe Ora is not a muse, you say, Musa, muse of the arts, mm -hmm. but she's definitely muse of life. And I like it this way. Um, be before we come to the journey that she makes, there's, there's a really remarkable passage, um, very powerful detail. Um, in which Aura describes how her vegetarian son has become a hardened soldier. And when he comes home from leave, she tries to find a place on his body that does not belong to the army, a demilitarized zone, a place for her hand. Uh, I remember interviewing a, um, a young Israeli soldier um, out on the West Bank, and I met him, he was about to come out of the army in four days, and so I met him on Schenken Street in Tel Aviv, and I didn't recognize him. And he said, I look very different without my helmet, don't I? And I said, completely different. You're not, not the same person. So I want to ask you if, you if you feel that the state has colonized the body of its people. It's not the state, I think, it's the situation. The situation. The situation, yeah. yes. When you are a soldier, you act as a soldier. Uh, when you are occupier, you act as an occupier. I, I think that, you know, if you read The Shooting an Elephant, yeah. uh, George the, the, the George Orwell story, you, you see how when you are stuck in a kind of a position, you are doomed almost, unless you are a very 
special individual, that, that you have the ability to re-articulate yourself in this situation, unless you are able to do that, you, you become, you know, you, you make the movements of a soldier and you wear the uniforms and in a way it infiltrates in, into your internal organs. Yeah. And I, I describe in, in To the End of the Land another scene when Offer, the soldier, comes back from the army after three weeks being in the field, in the occupied territories, and he comes back home. And this is something I remember very vividly from myself as a soldier and from my, my sons. And he opens the door and he stands in the door and he looks at home and suddenly home seems to him to be criminally exposed. You know, it's home with the tenderness and the softness and mommy and daddy and all the little nice objects and furniture and, car and carpets. And he comes from such a different reality. He really comes from a catastrophe zone. He cannot really believe that such things exist. You know, as if he totally disconnected his place in the envelope of, of the country and the interiority of, of this country, the thing that he is supposed to defend. And he, he looks at his father, who almost looks castrated to him because he's so civilian, so disarmed. And, and the father, who was a soldier himself, he recognizes this look and he knows how, how he, he's, he's seen by his son and he knows that his son thinks that I mean, they are really, they don't know what life is made of, you know? Because when you are there in the catastrophe zone, you really start to believe that this is reality, that there is no other reality. Now, the tragic thing is that there is a very strong subcurrent in our society that believes that this is true, you know, that this is reality, you know, that the reality, for example, that you have here in London, it's not a mistake, it's an illusion. I mean, most Israelis, if you dig deep into them, will tell you, you are living in an illusion. You don't know really what life is consist of. Life is eternal war and suspicion and being on the alert and being careful from any possible trap exactly as it is for you here to think about being in war again, it seems totally imaginary, far-fetched. You cannot really see yourself now here in, 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 in Britain, I mean, not by sending your troops to Iraq or Afghanistan, but here it seems impossible. Exactly it is the other way around for, for Israelis who really believe that it's a kind of a divine decree. And, okay. I, w I want to talk about this, this extraordinary journey that, it, that they make to the end of the land. Yeah. Um, so the landscape they pass through, seen through their eyes, is not innocent, but it's littered with monuments to fallen soldiers and a topography with both Jewish and Arab history. And I understand you made this hike across yeah. Israel yourself. And par part of what this novel is about is about the anxiety and fear that what is coming is the land of the end of the land, the land being the land of Israel, yeah. the Zionist dream, the Zionist experiment, that the country itself may be coming to an end. So can you talk about the hike and can you talk yeah. about what the land represents in this novel? Uh, first, I, I, I walked, yes, from the end of the land, which is the, 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 the border between us and Lebanon. I did it in 2004, and this was one of the, the sweetest rewards of writing this, this book. Um, just being alone in nature and uh, suddenly realizing, you know, how much all these labels we put on this soil, on this earth, you know, Zion, uh, the land of Israel, the promised land, Palestine, all the names that we people stick to, to nature, sometimes they really expose 
you know, our deep need to, to have a place, yes, but we are so temporary and we should be so more modest regarding this place and just recognizing how terrible it is that we are wasting our life in this endless war instead of allowing us some normal, bearable, good life by solving the problems that we have with our neighbors, problems that can be solved yet, maybe not for a long time, but, but can, right now there, there's still some window of opportunity. And I, I walked alone mo most of the time. I was warned by everyone that it might be dangerous. I never faced any danger from any human, only from animals. There was a, a, a bunch of stray dogs that became wild and they, they were quite threatening towards me or some uh, boars, wild pigs or snakes and scorpions, which are very frequent in Israel, but never from a human. Every, every person that I met, everyone, you know, they were so hospitable and friendly and open. And I, I also, before uh, taking to the hike, I, I thought I, I want to ask every person that I, that I meet, I want to ask him or her two questions. So I, I thought, you know, instead of having just a small talk, which can be very pleasant, but I, I felt I want to, to learn something from people. And I asked them two questions. What do you regret in your life and what do you long for in your life? There was a couple who told me that they are very simple life and they can, uh, very simple questions and they can really ruin your life if you think <laughs> deeply of them. And what amazed me was the immediacy with which people responded, as if they just had this answer prepared for someone to come and to ask them that. And, and I, I put most of the answers, uh, I put, uh, ma many of them I put in, in the book. By the way, there was one uh, monk in one of the monasteries, I will not say where, in the north of Israel, and, uh, and he... Uh, and he started to tell me about a nun who came from, I think, uh, Dominican Republic, and uh, he says that she knows nothing about the basis of the belief, and he has to teach her, and they walk out in the fields, and he teaches her, and she wouldn't listen, and she just wanted to sing all kinds of songs, and the more he spoke about her, it became very apparent that he's in love with her. And, and before the book was published, I traveled all the way to the north to get his uh, permission to publish what he said without names, without uh, identifying details. And he was no more in the monastery. He was sent away from the monastery. <laughs> um, moving slightly away from, well, moving away from literature, um, for a period of time, you were physically going to demonstrations. You were going to protests and were arrested and beaten up. Yes, every Friday? Yeah, in, uh, I mean, beaten up is a little too far. I mean, once I was beaten, so it's yeah. not, it was not a, a custom of the Israeli police to beat me. <laughs> yeah, uh, but, but every Friday, uh, there was, until a month ago, when it stopped, uh, for a year and a half, we had a demonstration against the taking over of the settlers in, uh, of the neighborhood, the, the Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem of Sheikh Jarrah. Uh, and uh, it was, you know, I thought it was a very good thing that it happened, that we had this weekly demonstration. But sometimes to go there and to see the same, what, 200 people, the usual suspects, yes. They are there every Friday in every weather, but rarely we manage to gather more. Yet I think it's important, you know. Uh, it is important. I, I, it reminds me of a story that once some years ago there was this demonstrator during the, the Vietnam War who demonstrated weekly in front of the White House in Washington and once a journalist came and asked him, do you really believe that you will be able to change the world? And he answered, no, but I just make sure that the world will not change me. 
And, and I think this is the point of, of standing there and also to show that there is another way. There is another way to converse with our neighbors. Uh, and, and that there is an alternative, you know, that there is this alternative of the dialogue, not only the, the language of power, which both sides, by the way, use against each other. It's a kind of a twin trap. We are so intertwined together in this terrible logic of hatred and violence that each party, Israel and Palestinians, is acting against its own interests. It's, I mean, if it wasn't my own mm -hmm. tragedy as an Israeli, I would have, you know, even find it fascinating. But you see how it works. You see how nations deteriorate to a way of behavior that is obviously destructive for them. They know it. And they are incapable of changing the course of events. They are, I mean, look, look at our government today the way they are, they are paralyzed in front of all the changes in the region, mm -hmm. the way that they are unable to do some initiative that would take us out of this deadlock, or to respond in an in enthusiastic and creative way to, to some other initiatives. Yes, half-heartedly Netanyahu has agreed to join this uh, initiative of the Quartet last week. He said without preconditions, and immediately he said what will be the, the conditions. By the way, so did the Palestinians. So did the Palestinians. So it's, I mean, as a writer, it's paradise. You know, you can trace so many of humans' faults and the places where we are trapping ourselves as human beings, as a society, and what happens to us in terms of, you know, the idea of having future or not having future, the, 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 the place the language occupies, I'm sorry to use this word in this context, the, the language occupies in, in, in these events, how the language that is meant to describe this reality starts to withdraw because it's too painful and does not describe reality, but rather buffer between the, the citizen of this drama and, and the reality. So that Israelis and Palestinians do not really no, especially more Israelis do not really know the costs, no, I'm not talking about money, but the, the real, the deep costs of, of this predicament, and they are unable to, to break through and to liberate themselves from it. So, uh, well, I mean, I wish I would live in a more boring place that I'll have to <laughs> invent all kind of crazy stories. Were you surprised by the sudden emergence of this huge social protest movement? Did, is, did Israelis surprise you by the extent to which they were prepared to take to the streets to demonstrate against you know, high housing costs? Yeah, I, I think like everyone, like, like the, the, the organizers of the uh, protest itself, we all were taken by surprise. I mean, I told you. It, it was so difficult to gather people in order to demonstrate for, for you know, something that has to do with the situation. But the situation prevailed and have dominated all our life and no one really wanted to go and to demonstrate against it. And suddenly there was this new wave of you know, young people, educated people, who are unable to, to, to sustain themselves who are helped and supported by their parents, and I know it uh, firsthand, and, and uh, they want to live in Israel, they want to raise up their children in Israel, they, they, they are the, the backbone of our society, you know, they, they are the people who will take the major part in, in serving in the army, and they feel this affinity to, to the ideas and the goals of Israel, and yet the country treats them with such, I mean, the, humiliates them. Mm. And you can see how the, the, the vigorous attitude that Israel has performed in the occupied territories eventually has infiltrated into the inner organs of us as, as a society. Uh, and, uh, you know, in all these, I can say now months, because it's now almost three months of this protest, 
the organizers and all the people who support this uh, uh, movement, they do not talk about the conflict. The conflict is being put aside. Now, you know my, my, my ideas and yet, my opinions, and yet I tell you, I find it to be a good thing. Because Israel needs, desperately, after 44 years of being stuck in this internal split, which evolved into suspicion within Israel and even hatred between the different parts, tribes of Israel, Israel needs desperately to taste again the, this sweet taste of solidarity. Mm -hmm. We, in a way, we have lost our solidarity because of the political debate. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we can feel solidarity when there are wars, but this is a kind of an imposed solidarity. But right now, for some weeks, we got this privilege to remember this really mineral that every society needs, and especially society in our situation, and especially, you know, the, the solidarity and mutual responsibility are deeply, profoundly Jewish and Israeli values. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the way to, to recover also in the level of the conflict goes through this recovery of the, of the solidarity of Israel. Because those ideas of equality of every human being, of the responsibility that we bear towards the weak, the, the unprivileged, the, the sick and the poor, in the end, hopefully, this is only speculation, might infiltrate back into the other question of us and the Palestinians. One final question before I open this up to the audience. Um, when Ian McEwen writes a novel like Chesil Beach about you know, a young couple on their honeymoon in the early 1960s. He doesn't get reviews saying, why are you not writing about the Iraq war? You know, <laughs> why do you not enter the mind of you know, an innocent Iraqi who has been yeah. murdered by the British army? Um, as an Israeli writer, and I, you know, I read the reviews in the British press, you know, there is the expectation that every novel that an Israeli novelist writes must be about the conflict. Uh, number one, and if it isn't about the conflict, then it's an allegory of the conflict. Yeah. Um, and secondly, that you must mm. have in that novel Palestinian characters. Falling in love with a uh, that's Israeli right. woman. Though, yeah, of course, yeah. if you do have Palestinian characters, then that's ventriloquism mm. and that you are colonizing, you yeah, know, yeah. occupying the mind. How could you possibly know? In this, this novel, there is, a, there is a, a very powerful moment in which um, Aura calls on the family Palestinian taxi driver and orders him to, to drive her boy to the front, to his, his army duty, which he does with gritted teeth and much bad grace. Um, on, and she asks him to turn off the radio, and he won't. So, how, so I suppose the question is, well, two, I have two questions really. Mm. What, one is, how do you write about the other? How do you write about the person who is the enemy, who has yeah. been um, defined as the enemy? And the second question is, we both agree that we do not like the phrase, the writer of conscience. Does the novelist, does the writer have the right to remain silent? Yeah. Well, how many questions, Linda? Just two. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yes, I think the writer has the right to remain silent. I think the writer, a writer, has only one duty, and this is to tell a good story. Okay. I, I have no, you know, I'm not disappointed that some of my friends or colleagues who totally do not want to write about the situation, I think they miss something because it's a way to, to understand, to decode the codes of this situation, and as, as I have said just now, it's a very intriguing situation, but I can also understand the need, the thirst, you know, to, to write about some normal universal topics. Mm. Why not? Uh, you asked about writing uh, from the point of view of the other. I, I, I will just say one, one more thing regarding the first part. Uh, you know, I, I remember when my, one of my books came out in, in Italy, 
uh, the first interviewer there entered and, and he asked me, is the broken leg of the man in the back seat of the car, is it a metaphor for the shattered Zionist dream? Yeah, and it's a man, it's a man who is crazily jealous of his wife. And, and I, I looked at him and I, I felt, you know, I mean, how it is insulting even to, to, to pigeonhole and to reduce everything to, to politics only. Life is so much complex and multi-layered than that. And I told him, you know, even, even though we are Israelis, we have the right to be jealous for our wives and, you know, just to be human beings. We, we are not totally confiscated by the situation. Even though writing about the situation is a way to, to reclaim, I, I will speak of myself, writing this book was a way to reclaim my individuality that the, con that the situation in a way has confiscated, you know, to, to be able again to speak in my own language and, and to call things by private names, not the, the names that the government or the media or the army tries to, to, try to impose on me. Uh, so this is the first uh, part. And then, of course, I think part of the, the sweetness of writing, Kafka spoke about the sweet reward of writing, is the ability to, to float, you know, very flexibly between other minds and, and bodies and to be other people. You know, we, we are so protected from the radiation of other people, not only from our enemies, which might be understandable, although I think it's a mistake. But we are even blocked to the people who are the most close to us and the most relevant to us. And maybe because they are so close to us and they expose us in a way, or let's say we do not want really to be exposed to, to their strong inner radiation, we block parts of ourselves. You can see it in, in, among you know, married couples. Not here, of course. In London, you are really perfect. But in Jerusalem, sometimes... I, and, and they are a wonderful couple, and they, they function brilliantly as a family, as parents, and they love each other, and yet you see the places where they have congealed in front of each other. To the extent that they do not really know each other. In, you know, the, 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 the biblical word to know a woman uh, from the Bible, and Adam knew his wife Eve. I have, I have a friend who says that maybe he knew her, but he never really understood her. <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, we sometimes think that, you know, when we make love, we really know the other, yes? But it's not like that, because in these sweet moments, we, we push away from our mind the places where our partner is, is tormented or tormenting or unbearable. We just don't want to remember that. So it means that even in the most intimate moments, we do not really know the other. But when, when I write about someone who is totally different from me, I have this really privilege to, to, to know what does it mean to be another human being? How is it like? What, what does it mean to be you? To, to, to feel this filament that goes in you. What is that? And it's not easily uh, achieved because I feel that I myself, I'm afraid of it. You know, it, it takes time. This is why I like writing novels because it allows you to, to have this couplehood with the book and, and you change the book and the book changes you. And gradually, you know, you peel layer after layer of this cataract from your soul until you are really exposed to the other you are writing about. And suddenly, it is there, and suddenly you can be, with capital B, you can be this other, and, and to see how he or she experiences life, and how he has his special language. You know, I think all of us, even if we are not aware of that, every one of us has a special language, some words that he or she prefers, and idioms, and the way we structure the sentences, and the 
the, the tonus, yes, the, the voltage of, of our language. And sometimes, of course, you meet people who totally do not have this private language. It's rare, by the way. And this is so despairing to, to see people who are just you know, quoting mm. language. And to, to be able to document it, it's, I, I think this is the, the, you know, the drug that pushes us you know, to sit for three, four, five years without really any satisfaction. And to have this place, this bubble of the story, and maybe another thing that is one of these incentives of becoming a writer is the, the, the really gift of doing or dealing with relevant materials. Because so much of our life is dictated by irrelevancies, by irrelevant people whom we shall not even invite for coffee. And they have the power to, to doom us to life or to death. And by all kinds of arbitrary events and coincidences, and when you write, you deal really with relevant things. And even in the beginning, when I start writing a book, I'm not really sure why, why do I write this story? I, I am intrigued by it. But I don't, do not necessarily understand why this specific character sticks to me. Yes, why it in a way insists that I will look at her direction. And then gradually when I write and write and then I see to what extent I am her and she is me, even when it's the most atrocious character. But just by, by chance, I was spared from becoming her. But I can now explore this untaken road, yes, this option of me that could have been me and, and not.